Okay, who of you is mentally ill? Damn, we need more diagnosis! Elon Musk openly stated how his autism makes him feel differently. Emma Watson was dealing with ADHD symptoms while filming the Harry Potter movies. The YouTuber Matt from Yes Theory quit social media because of the overwhelm social media gave to him as a highly sensitive person. These three figures represent the visible tip of an iceberg that reaches far into our society. In fact, 1-2% to 2 of people are diagnosed with autism. That's between 80 to 160 million worldwide. 6-7% to 7 are diagnosed with ADHD. That's another half a billion and 20% of our population is considered to be highly sensitive according to science, another 2 billion. Not considering all the other people facing anxiety, depression or other conditions. Using medical literature, we label a majority of them as mentally ill, just like having heart disease or diabetes, and treat them as modern medication and pharmaceutical drugs. We must admit the disastrous fact that today we reached a point in our society where we might have created widespread illness just by ourselves. Neurotypical equality, functionality and meritocracy are the norm that we trust. Diagnostic manuals such as the ICD and the DSM, our holy bible, official institutions like the American Psychiatric Association are our church. From this angle we have long since found ourselves in a global pandemic of mental illness that is continuously spreading the neurodivergence pandemic. But how could we reach the point where suddenly so many of us face diagnosable mental disorders? Is every one of us today mentally ill? To answer these questions, we will today deep dive into the story behind how mental disorders did arise in the past centuries. We will uncover how a neurodivergence movement is created discuss the consequences of putting labels on us for having certain conditions and we will answer the question of the why and I have to admit that this was one of the most exciting and interesting episodes I have ever made and researched so definitely stay tuned and let's find out in today's episode whether our society is actually not as ill as it seems. Already in the Middle Ages in the 16th century, there was a term for mental illness called madness. In Christian Europe, madness was considered to be a mix of the divine, the diabolical, the magical, humoral and the transcendental. Mentally ill people were considered as witches or sorcerers and were persecuted back then. At the end of the 17th century, madness was regarded as a physical phenomenon with no connection to mental health. So people with phenomena that we now regard as, for example, anxiety disorders, panic or confusion, were placed under asylum and treated like wild animals. Not until the end of the 18th century were moral treatments gradually introduced. In contrast, our current treatments are not so bad, aren't they? During the emerging period of industrialization and rapid population growth in Western countries, mental illness as well was developing rapidly. Classifications and diagnoses were then drawn up by various specialists and doctors and then finally in 1808 the medical speciality of psychiatry was coined. Later in 1844, the American Psychiatric Association, which consists up to this day, was founded. Real progress was then made in the 20th century when Sigmund Freud, probably you all know this name, founded the psychoanalysis, which was later continued by his daughter Anna Freud. By the way, I have to say, 
Freud was definitely a real badass. Check out his style. We should also mention the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Gustav Jung here, who broadened Freud's work and founded analytical psychology in 1913. Incidentally, with the development of psychoanalysis, mentally ill inmates were also renamed into patients and asylums were renamed into hospitals. Perhaps we are now on the brink of the next big revolution and will soon call patients with mental conditions human beings. While the First World War was raging at the beginning of the 20th century, the number of people with mental illnesses increased dramatically. The so-called shell shock, defined as a combat stress reaction, or also called battle fatigue, affected a huge number of surviving soldiers who were left with the wounds of war trauma. As the traumatic and tragic events of World War II repeated themselves, more and more people were left with severe mental wounds and illnesses. Incidentally, we still carry these wartime wounds within us today. They are deeply engraved in the nervous systems of our grandparents and parents and are still passed on to many people today as a so-called transgenerational trauma. In the literature, this is also referred to as war grandchildren. Around the Second World War, the first diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, the so-called DSM, was created and published by the American Psychiatric Association due to the numerous traumatizations. The International Classification of Diseases, the ICD, also developed its first section on mental illnesses. By the way, this was also the first time that the term stress, which was previously just known from endocrinology, also found its way into the context of mental health and illness. Slowly, the concept of mental illness was put together from individual pieces of the puzzle. However, it was a tough road and there were many dissenting voices and critics of this concept. For example, the psychiatrist Thomas Zass doubted that mental illness even existed. He claimed that mental illness was a myth created to make moral conflicts unrecognizable. Or Irvin Goffman, who claimed that society created mental illness in order to label and control nonconformists and by many behavioral psychologists who challenged psychiatrists' fundamental reliance on unobservable phenomena. Concepts of psychoanalysis and mental health and illness eventually prevailed, and so the DSM and also the ICD were further developed so that today we have the DSM-5 and the ICD-11 as of the end of 2023. That is the long story behind mental illnesses. But now we have a trend towards neurodivergency. So let's have a look, how did neurodivergence develop? Towards the end of the 20th century, we were left with two balding books full of medical diagnoses. And it was precisely at this point that a counter movement developed, just as it is common for us humans, and this counter-movement is convinced of neurological biodiversity instead of clinical diagnosis. ADHD was first mentioned in 1968 in the DSM-2 as a hyperkinetic reaction of childhood. In 1980, Attention Deficit Disorder, ADD, was added to the third edition of the DSM. Then the term autism first appeared in the DSM in the third edition in 1980 as well as infantile autism. Diagnostic criteria for autistic disorder first appeared in 1987. With the introduction of the new diagnosis, the autism right movements emerged at the end of the 1980s. In 1992, Jim Sinclair founded the Autism Network International, the so-called ANI, which disseminated events and newsletter by and for autistic people. The ANI does not see autism as a disease to be treated, but as a disability with several variations in the human brain. 
Supporters of the movement believe that the autism spectrum and also the spectrum of cousin diagnosis such as ADHD should be accepted as a natural expression of the human genome and accommodated like other non-pathological conditions. Shortly before the turn of the millennium, the term neurodiversity was coined for the first time in 1998 by the American writer Harvey Bloom and the Australian sociologist Judy Singer. Today, we understand neurodiversity as a concept which argues that differences in brain function and cognition are normal and that some conditions classified as mental disorders are just differences and disabilities that are not necessarily pathological. Neurodiversity therefore refers to all the conditions that deviate from the norm. This includes autism spectrum disorder, ASD, attention deficit and hyperactive disorder, ADHD, but also something like a sensory processing sensitivity, so the high sensitivity when you're a highly sensitive person, as well as dyslexia, anxiety disorders or other specific personality disorders. Everything that is not included, in other words, the normal people, is referred to as neurotypical in this concept. These neurotypical people just fit the norm of society's usual thought patterns. If we look at mental disorders from a perspective of the concept of neurodiversity, we can identify problems with the definition of mental disorders we have today in our medical literature. I also talked about that broadly before in the episode is HSP a mental disorder? After knowing the history behind how mental disorders develop, today we define it as followed. A mental disorder, also referred to as mental illness or psychiatric disorder, is a behavioral or mental pattern that causes significant distress or impairment of personal functioning. That significant stress and impairment of personal functioning is what we as a society see in the context of our modern high-functioning world. That is the frame, the standard, the neurotypical way of living. In the DSM, we can read that mental illnesses are health conditions involving changes in emotion, thinking or behavior or a combination of these. Mental illnesses can be associated with distress and or problems functioning in social, work or family activity. And mental illness is pretty common. In a given year, nearly one in five, that's 19% of US adults experience some form of mental illness. One in 24, that's 4.1% has a serious mental illness, a major depressive disorder, schizophrenia or bipolar disorders and 1 in 12, that's 8.5%, has a diagnosable substance use disorder. But the American Psychiatric Association also gives us hope, and they have great news. Mental illness is nothing to be ashamed of. It is a medical problem, just like heart disease or diabetes. And second, mental illness is treatable. The vast majority of individuals with mental illnesses continues to function in their daily lives. So so summarized according to the American Psychiatric Association, ASD and ADHD, for example, are categorized and compared as medical problems such as heart diseases, which are by the while the most common cause of death in the United States of America. Now, fact is, many of us are getting labeled by these disorders. A lot of the discussion already exists around the big question, what are these labels doing to us? While one of the core functions of the DSM is categorizing people's experiences based on their perception into medical diagnosis based on symptoms, there is a lot of disagreement created in using diagnosis as labels. In the comments on the several videos on YouTube, I found two groups of people. The first group are people who feel a sense of release after getting a diagnosis for a condition, 
which they then can apply a name to. This camp also includes many people who self-diagnose themselves using information from videos or websites from the internet. The second group are people who strongly disagree with being labeled just by a catalog of symptoms that may occur in their daily experiences. Those people also question the inaccuracy and narrative of people being able to self-diagnose themselves using information from online content also given by the DSM. Some people also criticize that labels such as autism, ADHD, anxiety disorders or similar ones invite social stigma and discrimination to happen. What I also want to mention here is the issue with self-diagnosing when facing mild or moderate symptoms of a condition. Or you can identify, for example, with a given set of traits, which is, for example, let's say specific for autism. If you watched a previous episode about autism or ADHD, you know that these disorders appear on a spectrum. Same is true for a sensory processing sensitivity. A huge question that arises here is, where are we drawing a line here? Is everyone else who is somewhere on the spectrum facing let's say some symptoms, but not enough for being diagnosed, just normal or neurotypical, because that's true if you take this definition, for example, for a mental condition from the DSM. Let's make an example here. Let's say you do a clinical test for ADHD. The DSM gives you nine checkboxes here for the inattentive type and nine checkboxes for the hyperactive impulsive type. As an adult, you can be diagnosed ticking five out of nine. Let's say you tick just four out of nine. Now you are an individual with mild ADHD symptoms, but not being diagnosed or labeled because you just do not tick enough boxes. Let's say you have a friend and your friend ticks five out of nine, then he is clinically diagnosed with ADHD, getting labeled with it and being called mentally ill with a disease we compare with the leading cause of death in the United States, coronary heart diseases, while you are not being called anything, not being labeled with anything and not getting any treatment or prescriptions. I feel it's pretty weird to have such a black or white scheme for conditions we know to be in a gray tone and exist on a wide spectrum with different variations. Another aspect of labels and diagnosis is something I already discussed in the context of trauma in my CPTSD video, which I will link here, and that is the internalization process of diagnosis. When internalizing a label, it might become part of your identity. And when something becomes part of your identity, it will influence your perception and your processing of experiences. This especially happens to many survivors of trauma also childhood trauma. So this context is pretty linked, as I said, to PTSD or CPTSD. For example, when you had unstable relationships with your parents who were constantly yelling at you as a kid, you learn that relationships are probably unsafe and that you can't really trust anyone. You may therefore become avoidant as a result. And you may deeply believe, I do best on my own. I don't need anyone. If you internalize that belief now, it may become your identity. From that point of time, you are avoidant and you don't need anyone. That is the label you now put on yourself. You say, I do best on my own. That's just how I am. That's just who I am. But the truth is that it's actually just the trauma that is telling that to you. And same is true for autism or ADHD labels. If you say, I'm an artist, I have social anxiety, that is just who I am, then you're internalizing that label. Internalized labels can make symptoms worse 
and makes psychotherapy incredibly hard. A psychotherapist is now not just working with a client with given symptoms and challenges separated from their identity. No, he or she is working with someone who internalized symptoms as a part of their self and identity. There are also psychiatrists and psychologists who voice critics against labels created by the DSM. In 2012, the psychiatrist Ellen Francis warned in a New York Times editorial that the DSM version at that time, quote, will medicalize normality and result in a glut of unnecessary and harmful drug prescription. In a following blog post on Psychology Today in December that same year, Francis published a list of DSM-5's 10 most potential harmful changes. The ADHD symptoms described in this version of the DSM therefore encourage psychiatric prescription of stimulants than autism describing the disorder more specifically in that version of the DSM that may lead to decreased rates and disruption of school services than major depression disorders include normal grief here and generalized anxiety disorders include everyday worries here. Now all this leads us to the big question of the why. Why are we all doing that? Why are we creating a neurodivergence pandemic all by ourselves? Why did we create labels for conditions that are anything else than deadly diseases? And I want to make clear that I do not want to negate autism or ADHD here. There are some cases in which those affected definitely suffer from various symptoms. It's much more about all the people who do not experience strong forms or who are still on the spectrum but not being clinically diagnosed. And it's also all about those people who recognize themselves in various conditions. To find an answer on that big question, we dig a bit deeper. The DSM has been widely criticized and commented on since the early 1990s. In particular, it was debated that the way the categories were structured in the DSM resulted in increased prescription and use of pharmaceutical drugs. We are talking here about a medicalization of human nature. In 2005, the president of the American Psychological Association, APA, released a statement admitting that half of the authors who described the psychiatric disorders in the DSM-5 had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry between the years 1989 and 2004. This naturally raises the question of whether there is a direct conflict of interest here. Coincidentally, the relationships between the panel members and the pharmaceutical companies were present precisely for the mental disorders for which drug treatment was the primary treatment method. Coincidentally. For schizophrenia and mood disorders, 100% of panel members had direct financial ties with the pharmaceutical industry. Psychiatrist William Glasser argued that the DSM was, quote, made to help psychiatrists, to help them make money. What inspired you to build a second Krusty Krab right next door to the original? Money! So is this whole system of diagnosis of mental disorders just designed to make as much money as possible for drug companies and health professionals who are tied to the sector? Maybe. Another point of view I would like to discuss here is the perspective from which we view the symptoms of the conditions. Is it always just about the children or the people affected? Let's look at the diagnostic criteria for ADHD in children, for example. We have a list of nine checkboxes here for the inattentive type of ADHD. And if we read those diagnostic criteria, for example, often fails to give close attention to details, 
make careless mistakes in schoolwork, then we have often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, often avoids dislikes or is reluctant to do tasks that require mental effort over a long period of time, is often easily distracted, it seems that the core issue here is that parents and teachers should have as few problems with the children as possible. We are therefore looking at the symptoms primarily from a perspective of what fits in well with our current image of society, school and the workplace. Anyone who doesn't fit in, simply speaking, because they can't sit still for long enough time, is diagnosed and labeled. I know that's very clumsy and simplistic here, but it's a point of view that I have been often read about during my research. Now, let's zoom out a bit more. Lastly, as human beings, we always long to be special. As Dale Carnegie accurately summarized in my favorite book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, based on Freud's teachings, everything we do as human beings has two motives, the sex drive and the desire for personal recognition. So we always strive to be different and to have rare desirable qualities. In the modern age of individualism, labels such as autism or ADHD can serve to stimulate our desire for recognition. The encouragement from movements such as the LBGQ plus movement and the fact that we advocate for minorities today instead of discriminating against them encourages these thoughts as well. In other words, it's just to be cool to have autism. I'm different from you and I embrace it. This observation is also underlined by the fact that many of us now wait a month for autism or ADHD diagnosis. It is difficult to even find an appointment with a psychiatrist at all. And during my research, I also stumbled a lot across the term fashion diagnosis or desired diagnosis. So the question of the why probably does not have a clear answer here. There are multiple aspects who influence our need to create those labels. At some point I have to say it's still a difficult thing that we created those pathological labels that make a lot of people suffer. But it's definitely not just the labels that make people suffer. It's also the frame that we call today neurotypical, that we live in a performance-driven meritocracy. A chicken-egg question here is, who is responsible now for that? Is it society or is it the individuals? I would say both, in a way. Many people with conditions such as autism, ADHD or similar often blame themselves for their challenges. As a result, many of us carry deep feelings of guilt and toxic shame within us. I'm just different. I'm an alien. I do not fit into this world. Our definitely beliefs that many people with divine brain structures carry within them. This is where the concept of internalized ableism comes into play. Those affected that the problem lies exclusively with them and that they are wrong. They project negative feelings that belong to society onto themselves. Yet the current social system is simply not made for them. They cannot adapt to the predetermined norms and thought patterns of society. A big problem with this is that it forces some of them into the role of victim and takes away their power and scope for action. Society must certainly help to establish new structures for people who are neurodivergent independently of the meritocracy. But I'm also convinced that each and every one of us, whether with autism, 
ADHD, highly sensitive or other conditions, can do something to promote the social enlightenment. For example, by creating videos like this one and uploading them to YouTube or to other social media platforms. Plus, most of us are also able to build a life that meets our personal, mostly complex needs. I'm convinced that remote work, self-employment and online platforms make it easier than ever in history to decide for ourselves when, where and how much stimulation we expose ourselves or our nervous system to. This allows us to organize and structure our work and relationships according to our own discretion and schedule breaks and time off when we need them. Now the final question that we all carry around within us. Do we live in a sick society? I don't think so. At least not as sick as medical manuals make us out to be. There are people who clearly suffer from symptoms of autism, ADHD, anxiety, or even milder conditions such as a high sensitivity. However, there is also a large number of people who have mild or moderate symptoms can identify with the conditions and face challenges that are not threatening. Self-diagnosis is also a trend these days and I often find myself recognizing myself in various diagnoses. The more I deal with the topic of mental health, the greater the overlap between different clinical pictures seems to be. The use of modern technology and social media will also contribute to the fact that we increasingly identify with various diagnoses. Conditioning ourselves towards the constant release of dopamine is another factor here. How often have I distracted myself writing this video script here? I don't know. Entertaining videos, my most beloved contacts and delicious foods are just one mouse click away. Another quick glance at the cell phone, a click on a YouTube video, a reach for the candy shelf. Who can concentrate more than two minutes these days? Is that because we all have ADHD? I don't think so. Many of us feel increasingly lonely in our modern society. Stable and close relationships feel rarer than ever before. Social anxieties and inhibitions are amplified by the fact that we go out less and our lives increasingly take place online. Many people today claim to have social difficulties, attachment issues and to be shy. Is that because they all have autism? I don't think so either. We are probably not much sicker than before, but illness diagnoses are more present than ever. Perhaps all the stimuli we experience nowadays mean that our nervous systems have to absorb and process more input. Perhaps our nervous system is becoming increasingly sensitive as a result. And perhaps we feel more and more that we are developing conditions such as autism, ADHD, or SPS, which make us more sensitive and leave us with overwhelm and over arousal in an increasingly overstimulated world. We talked a lot about mental disorders, challenges and illness today. Whether we all have diagnosable mental disorders or not, to finish this episode, I still want to shed a light on the strengths and benefits of people with neurodivergent conditions. Every coin has a flip side, and so have conditions such as autism, ADHD, SPS or others. I would argue that it is a gift to have a more sensitive perception of the world. As people with autism, we may have social deficits, but we have outstanding talents and skills most other people just can dream of. As people with ADHD, we may experience a loss of focus or negative hyperfocus experiences, but we are also full of passion. We are joyful and bubble over with energy. As highly sensitive people, we may be struggling with regular over arousal, but we also do see details others can't experience. We all feel misplaced, misunderstood and somehow like aliens in our current frame of society. 
exactly if that makes us withdraw into our heads and deeply think about us and our true nature. We identify our personal and complex needs and learn to take care of ourselves. This way we can create and build a world we would love to live in and that has space for neurodivergent people of all kinds. Now let's summarize today's insights. What did we learn about the neurodivergence pandemic? As humans, we have been observed mental illness since the Middle Ages. With the establishment of modern analytical psychology, we developed diagnosis for various mental disorders in the medical literature, such as in the DSM and the ICD. Clinical diagnoses such as ADHD, autism and anxiety disorders mean that billions of people are mentally ill by definition. The counter movement does not call these conditions pathological, but neurodivergent. There are simply different variations in our brains. By giving ourselves labels for these conditions, many of us feel relieved while others internalize them and thus make further therapeutic treatments more difficult. Still others adorn themselves with desirable diagnosis to feel special and recognized. Ultimately, we are probably not a sick society. We categorize ourselves according to the nature of our brains. Some of us suffer more than others because of the challenges we are facing, while some of us even feel empowered by their condition. Our society is definitely not an ideal place for people with neurodivergent conditions. However, this should not force us as those affected into the role of victim. I believe that each of us has the strength and willpower to create a life that meets our personal and complex needs, and then the social framework will also change step by step.